Hello everyone! So here we are in our first of our pre-recorded lectures, uh, which are going to be made available to you on the Brightspace shelf for the course, as well as a backup platform on YouTube, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, so hopefully wherever and whenever you are watching this video, I hope that you, your friends and family are safe and comfortable with everything that's going on. Obviously, um, we're still working towards figuring out what everything looks like. So we're going to spend a little bit of this first lecture talking about the bookkeeping side of things. Ordinarily, in the lectures from this point forward, I am not going to do this in uh, uh, any great extent. Effectively, what I call the bookkeeping uh, is now going to be mostly through announcements in the Brightspace shell. I just want to talk about the current announcements we have there. But of course, we want to make sure that we're spending time getting content in. So keep checking the Brightspace shell for this course for the latest information that we have. So I'm just going to go to our Brightspace shell really quickly. Uh, in this particular case for this course, talk about the few main items that I have on here that are relatively new as we've transitioned into this new uh, online only approach to what's on the go. Um, so first things first, um, yeah, there's our last uh, particular thing that we had talking about last Wednesday uh, when um, they stopped in-person classes. So the first thing I want to mention is Chemistry has set up a virtual help center. So effectively through online rooms in Brightspace, you will be able to access um, all the same people who were using or staffing the help center beforehand. They should be available to answer questions as well. So effectively the virtual the Chemistry Virtual Help Center you're going to see is going to be accessible as a course in your Brightspace shell. We do also have a link here that will take you there. So effectively you go into the help center, make sure you read uh, all this content here, but effectively what you're going to do is go to communications, online rooms, and that is going to open up the Bongo kind of sub platform uh, within here. And you will be able to see which rooms you have active right now. Turns out that uh, someone looks like they may be testing the organic chemistry help. Now you'll notice it says scheduled here at 5.30. That is of course 5.30 my time. That would be 10 a.m. tomorrow. So it already looks like someone has one scheduled for organic chemistry helping. But you will be able to see um, Help Center uh, more relevant for this course there. So that's going to be one option you have. The next option that you're going to have is where you can watch these pre-recorded lectures anytime and anywhere that you are able to. What I'm going to do is turn our normal lecture times Monday to Thursday at 1 p.m. Newfoundland time. I will turn those into the virtual office hours. So what will happen there is we will use the Blue Jeans system. Um, so some of you have experience already but you see here that uh, we've already mentioned uh, the Blue Jean system here. You can click on this link. What that's going to do is take you into a Blue Jeans situation. Uh, you can launch the app. Again, you can download the app on your tablet or phone. If it's an Apple or an Android device, you will be able effectively you will also be able to do it through the web URL that you saw there. Of course this is showing I'm the only one here. It's not doing anything with my camera right now because I'm using my camera to record this lecture. But effectively yeah you can go to this link that you find in the Brightspace shell, click on that, um, and essentially you can touch base with me to ask questions again during the normal lecture times that we would have had for this course. Uh, if you're outside of those times, you're still going to want to email me and set up a meeting or start thinking about the Chemistry Virtual Help Center for getting your questions answered. Um, yep, yeah, so again, there's app versions for Apple and Android devices. Otherwise, on PCs, Macs, and whatever, you can get it through the URL provided in the Brightspace shell through a web browser. So I will close down that. I have likely closed down actually my Brightspace shell there, so let's get back in there. The wonders of technology. Try not to make mistakes if you can help it. Yeah, probably where 
most of you are wondering where things are going to go is going to be this particular item on the new evaluation scheme for 1010. I have talked about perhaps having a final exam in this course that would only cover chapters one to four. I've decided where we're really, um, you know, transitioning to this new system and where you have a lot of different final exams that are now going to be take home or, or, or there's a lot of different options out there. What I'm going to do is I am not going to have a final final exam in this course. Now the only big problem with that is the final exam was going to be half of the grade in this course. So what that means is by dropping the 50% final exam that's going to make every other evaluation metric essentially worth twice as much as it used to be. Because you weren't necessarily prepared for that I'm going to make some adjustments in how this can happen. So first things first is we had people who did not write the written midterm exam because they were sick. That just happens. Ordinarily what happens in that circumstance is I would take the, in this case, 10% of the midterm evaluation and add it on to the final exam to make it a 60% final exam. Obviously we cannot do that with no final exam in this course. So what I'm going to do is at some point, probably later this week, I'm going to make available to you a second chance midterm as a bright, uh, a bright space shell quiz, just like the bright space shell quizzes we've been having. This quiz is going to have a due date of April 9th, what would have been the last day of classes. And effectively, if you were a student who did not write the midterm exam, you will get two attempts at this bright space quiz. If you are a student who did write the written midterm, you will get one attempt at this bright space quiz, which will be timed. It will be 90 minutes long, effectively um, 90 minutes for a 50 minute exam paper. So those of you who would have uh, availed of the Blunden Center, for example, and it would have time and a half accommodation, my plan is to take a 50 minute kind of exam and give you effectively almost twice as long to write that in to deal with that. This midterm replacement or second chance midterm will effectively have a lot of the same question types that the original midterm had. I'm not going to come up with new question types. I really want to get a sense, give the opportunity for those of you who would like to improve upon your grade on the midterm or who did not write the midterm, an opportunity to show me what you can do on the same type of questions that actually showed up on that written midterm quiz. So that will be showing up probably sometime later this week. There will be at least a couple of weeks almost to work on that. But again, it is time. So once you start it, you need to finish it because your time will run out otherwise. And I'm not going to be all that big on reopening this particular thing. You know what's coming. The description and introduction to this uh, second chance midterm will also indicate that it's timed and that you need to complete it in one sitting. Your lab marks, effectively you did three experiments, so your lab marks are going to be based on the three labs that were held in person. For those of you who are in the lab waiver section, we will be reusing your lab mark from the previous time you took the course like we ordinarily would. Tutorial marks will be based on whatever evaluations Tiber already gave. If he wants to include any further evaluations in the tutorial part of that. Um, I'm just going to wait for him to post an announcement about that. Otherwise, we will go with the tutorial mark as it stands. If there are any of the assignments in Mastering Chemistry that you would like another shot at, please let me know. You can email me, but understand this. If you want another chance at any particular assignment, first you have to tell me exactly what assignment it is. I'm not going to be tracking it down for you, so you're going to have to tell me by the assignment titles which one they are. Once I reset an assignment, I am not able to see your previous answers or your previous grade. So it is possible that you could redo an assignment and get a worse mark on it. So you need to be prepared for the questions on a given assignment that you want reset and know that you are in a better position because you've gone back and strengthened your understanding of that particular material that you can go back and effectively improve upon what's there. Any uncompleted Mastering Chemistry assignments, whether they're in the past or the ones that are still going to happen because we're going to have daily assignments associated with each recorded lecture on Mondays and to Thursdays, and the 
uncompleted Bryce Space quizzes. We've still got two more forthcoming. Uh, one will probably show up later this week, and probably one will show up later next week. Uh, so again, any uncompleted assignments and quizzes have due dates of effectively the last day of final exams right now. That may have to come back to April 16th, which would have been our actual scheduled exam date. But still, really what I'm trying to tell you is you've got some time to kind of fit things in. So you will be able to go back and complete work you have not done. I'm not going to be resetting any of the Brightspace quizzes, though, because at some point we have to have some bits and pieces that um, are effectively based on what was already uh, performed. You would have also noticed that the university has informed you that you as a student are going to have an option for every course that you are taking this semester that's transitioned to this online only approach. You're essentially going to be given a choice on whether you want to receive a numeric grade for this course or a pass fail grade for this course. The big difference between the numeric grade and the pass fail is pass fail, all that means is that we have said that you have either passed the expectations for this course or you have failed the expectations for this course. Since there is no number, there is no number that would be attached to this course if you choose pass fail, that would be used in determining your GPA or your cumulative average overall. Those things are important, for example, when you determine scholarships, when you determine academic standards about whether you can continue to register at the university, although the university has already announced for this semester that no one will be required to discontinue or withdraw from the university based on what has happened this semester. Um, so effectively, really what you're trying to say is, do I want to let other people know on my transcript that I took this course and I passed it? If you passed it, anything that would require this course as a prerequisite, like biochemistry for nursing, they will just say, look, they passed 1010, yep, you can register for biochemistry for nursing. In other situations, of course, like let's say chemistry 1051, you would need to get a 60% in that before you could take many of our second year chemistry courses uh, at St. John's campus. Uh, that pass would essentially say you got a 60, even if you hadn't, because effectively what that pass is going to say is you will meet the prerequisites for any course that requires this particular one. Again, that's not going to be a big deal for us in Chemistry 1010. Really, the pass-fail is going to be most important for those of you who are thinking about nursing and want to take biochemistry for nursing. This is going to be a prerequisite. Otherwise, the pass will get you into 1050 if that is the path of chemistry that you are looking to work towards for whatever degree option you are uh, looking at. Uh, to let me know whether you choose a pass or fail, uh, system or the numeric grade, I'm going to set up a single multiple choice question Brightspace quiz, effectively saying I would like to be given a numeric grade or pass fail. I will essentially use this information when I submit the grades uh, under the particular system. You will get again until uh, the last day of of doing things. Right now I say April 21st, it may have to come back to April 16th, what would be the actual final exam date in this course. Uh, the, you'll get to choose. So again, you've got some time to think about it, and as we start getting the term marks in there, the lab marks and the tutorial marks, you'll be in a much better position to assess where things are at. I want to do it through this quiz system so I don't have to deal with a, a potentially up to 160 emails. I can have everything stored in one place in that particular case. That's going to make it easier for me. If you do not complete this quiz telling me whether you want a numeric grade or a pass-fail grade, the default is that I am going to set it as pass-fail. That's because effectively the people who are most likely not to let me know are the people who are likely going to get uh, a very sub-50 grade in the course, and therefore I would want to set that as fail uh, instead of, let's say, a uh, numeric grade of 35, because that's not going to have any effect on your GPA or cumulative average moving forward. Because while the university is not going to have any penalties in terms of academic withdrawal based on this semester right now, a year from now, uh, when they, or the let's say next fall semester when they re-implement this, um, yeah, they're going to be using your average at that point. And so I'm going to effectively say, yeah, I'm going to default to pass-fail unless you tell me otherwise. Let me remind you, though, this is your choice. You will be given that option, and 
I just want to let you know that uh, that's going to be happening. Now, we've got about 33 minutes left in this video. There's another bookkeeping item that I really want to talk about. Uh, the Brightspace system is a robust cloud-based system, so all the content is saved out in the internet ether. Uh, and so uh, the Brightspace system, uh, we don't anticipate any problems with the Brightspace system. However, our access to the Brightspace system is done and accomplished through MUN web servers, which do depend, of course, on MUN support personnel, the great people over at um, you know, ITS and all that. They're doing a great job uh, getting everyone transitioned over. But the simple fact of life is if they get sick, if they have to shut down on-campus operations, if there's any power outages on campus to take down the web servers or whatever, our Brightspace might not be available. Chances of this happening, very, very small. Don't get worried about this. I'm just telling you that what I'm doing is setting up some backup resources so you will be able to access content in the very unlikely event that things uh, go and get shut down in terms of the MUN side of things. So all your pre-recorded lecture content like this particular recording, all class sides and intellectual problem solving, they're all going to show up in the same Brightspace course content sections as they always have. However, the, core, uh, the content of class slides, my PowerPoint slides, and the in-class problem solving in the pre-recorded lectures now that I do on my iPad that I have been posting, I will post in the course content section of the Brightspace shell, but I'll also be posting in two other locations. Uh, all the pre-recorded videos will be showing up in my YouTube playlist, which means if Brightspace goes down, you will be able to go to this tiny URL link to get to this, my playlist for Chem 1010 pre-recorded lectures. There's only one in there right now. It is a test lecture, me testing this particular software setup that I'm using now. It's working out pretty well. And so you will have the option of seeing videos here. You will also have the option of getting the course content through a Google Drive that I set up for this purpose. And so you essentially see that we've got two different directories. Here we have the course slides up until this point, up to module eight gases. I will still be posting more content as I complete it. Obviously transitioning over finding software tools has taken some time. So it's going to take me a little time to get up to speed. And here's all our in-class problem solving. So effectively, all this material is going to be available in two places. And there is a secondary advantage to this in that if you've traveled home, which many of you I know have to do, especially if you were living in residence, you might now be back around the bay um, in your small community in Newfoundland and Labrador, you might be back in Labrador, you might be back in your home country halfway around the world. In those situations, your internet access and bandwidth may be more limited than they were to you when you lived in St. John's. So the other advantage of the YouTube version of the lectures that I am pre-recording is that YouTube, of course, can dynamically alter the resolution of what's being served to you um, to essentially make the best use of your internet capabilities. And if you're watching on a device and using a data plan on your phone or a tablet, obviously that gives you the option of maybe downgrading the resolution so you're not necessarily streaming as much content because, of course, data overages could be a big issue for some of you in those particular circumstances. Again, this can only happen for the pre-recorded lectures that I'm doing as of March 23rd onwards. Any of the original lecture capture recordings from our in-class lectures, I cannot actually download and post those to YouTube, so you would have to go to the normal course content section of lecture capture to find those. Um, it would be nice if I could do download those and make backups, but unfortunately that's not necessarily an option that we are given uh, through the Brightspace shell. So of course, if you want to go back and look over any of the earlier lectures, especially of those of you who are trying to catch up, get caught up on assignments that you've missed and whatever and want to go back, this is the first place to look. Any lectures past March 23rd, or on March 23rd, will be able to be found uh, in our 
Now pre-recorded lectures, Brightspace Shell, here we see that we've got the test there, or in the YouTube version that is available as well. Again, through this tiny URL, pretty straightforward to remember. So that is pretty much the bookkeeping that we have. Daily Mastering Chemistry assignments will still happen, so there's going to be one Monday the 23rd. There's going to be one Tuesday the 24th, and so on for all the remaining lectures of the course. Uh, those Mastering Chemistry daily assignments will be related to the content of the pre-recorded lecture for that particular date. So that will give you an idea of where things will line up, just like they have been lining up that way for all the lectures to this point. This is, of course, the place where I would open things up for questions. I cannot do that in this pre-recorded lecture. So again, come and join me for office hours in your regular lecture times through the Blue Jeans system. Again, easiest way to do that is through this URL, or if you've downloaded the app, you can enter this nine-digit number, 754-690-242, as your meeting that you are joining. When you come into the meetings, please have your microphones muted and your cameras off if you don't want to be seen. But if you want to ask questions, you're eventually going to have to unlock things uh, and open things up. So realize that everyone else who is in the meeting will be able to see you when you ask your questions. But frankly, that's a small price to pay. Just make sure there's no identifying information about you or where you live or something like that, um, just to keep safe. And that's, of course, based on your own sense of privacy and comfort. Do whatever you have to do to feel comfortable as you access my online virtual office hours. Looking at my phone, I see that I've taken about half of today's lecture time uh, to talk about the bookkeeping. Again, bookkeeping will not be as robust at the beginning of the lectures. You really need to come and check your announcements in the Brightspace shell for the latest information. So that is the bookkeeping for March 23rd. And what I would like to do is now continue on with the last part of Module 7, really the last part of Chapter 4, where we talk about dilution of solutions and uh, essentially solutions in reaction stoichiometry. So what I'm going to do now is close this. Here you see the actual software I'm using. It's the uh, open broadcaster software. It looks kind of weird because it kind of gives this whole inception thing on the go. Ooh, funky uh, mouse trails. But really, yeah, what I'm going to do now is set up my slideshow and get going. Now, we would have seen the idea that when we have stuff dissolved in solution, effectively, that's an amount of stuff dissolved in solution. I use the analogy of kids floating around in a swimming pool. So if you go to the aqua arena and you've got kids in the shallow end of the swimming pool and they've got a barrier there, you might have 10 kids swimming around in the shallow area of the pool. If I lift that barrier, though, those 10 kids can now can spread out over the entire swimming pool. That's the same as the idea of dilution or mixing of solutions. When I lift up the barrier, that's like if I pour more solvent in, let's say more water, into a cup of strong coffee, making the coffee not as strong. I still have the same amount of flavor components, but they're now floating around in a bigger pool, and therefore the coffee now tastes weaker. That's the same 10 kids who were in the shallow end of the pool, who are now available to swim in the entire pool. And since chemistry depends on the amount of interesting stuff, just like the number of kids in the pool, then what that means is I can use an understanding of the size of the pool and kind of a relative comparison or a concentration uh, to figure out the actual amount of, uh, let's say, kids in the pool or amount of chemical in moles. And so we would have seen that the connection to that is that the number of moles of the substance is the solution concentration for that substance in moles per liter multiplied by the volume of the solution we have in liters. Now, when it comes to dilution, we're going to use that same idea to our advantage. If there are 10 kids in the pool before I lift the barrier up and they can spread out over the entire pool, guess what? Lifting the barrier did not change the number of kids in the pool. There are still 10. So in other words, the number of kids I have before I lifted the barrier has to equal the number of kids after I lifted the barrier. 
And in terms of the chemical context, what that means is the moles of interesting stuff in my solution before I mixed solutions together or added some more solvent is going to have to equal the number of moles of that same substance after I do my mixing, after I add more solvent in. Because at the end of the day, the mixing is a physical process. It's not chemically changing the amount of stuff. We're going to leave that for our chemical reactions that we're interested in. Since moles can be calculated by the molarity, capital M, before mixing, uh, times the volume before mixing, that means that's going to have to equal the moles after mixing and the volume after mixing. Which means we now have four different pieces of information. If I know any three of those, I can obviously solve now for the fourth one. So if I know the concentration I have before mixing and the volume I have before mixing, and I now know a new volume after I added some water to my strong coffee, I can find the concentration of the now weaker coffee that I have just made. And so in fact, that's how we're going to approach things. So here we could take some sort of solution we've already made, put it into a volumetric flask, fill up with more water to the line, and we've accomplished dilution. So here we see that the moles, or the concentration, molarity, might have been 10 moles per liter beforehand, and we took 150 milliliters of that. That means that contained 1.50 moles of interesting stuff. In this case, it's calcium chloride. Here, we then take this to a new volume of three liters. And what we're going to find is that if we want to have that same one and a half moles of calcium chloride in the new solution, well, that new solution is going to have to have a concentration of 0 0.500 moles per liter. The concentration went from 10 to half, 1 20th of what it used to be. That is a much, 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 much weaker cup of coffee than the one I started with because I added a whole lot more water. I made the swimming pool for the interesting stuff a whole lot bigger while not changing the amount of the interesting stuff. Just checking to see my timing here. It looks like I've got about another 20 minutes for this video. So that's great. That's going to give us some time to work on this problem and some other aspects of what's going on here. So here we have our problem that um, Brain is not working. Never seems to work as well as I want it to. So here we go. Going back to our problem solving system. That's not it. That's it. There we go. So again, this is going to show up in the course content section and in our backup on Google Drive, I will have this. To what volume in milliliters should you dilute a 100.0 milliliter calcium chloride solution with a concentration of 5.00 moles per liter if you want to obtain a 0.750 mole per liter calcium chloride solution at the end? So this is really no different than the picture we just saw. We will take some amount of solution, in this case 100.0 milliliters, that, con uh, that solution has a concentration of 5.00 moles per liter. How much more total volume would I need? How big would the new swimming pool have to be for this to become a 0 0.750 mole per liter calcium chloride solution instead? So in terms of solving this problem, we're going to use the idea that the molarity before mixing and the volume before mixing equals the molarity after mixing and the volume after mixing. Pretty straightforward. Now, we are effectively being asked to what volume should you dilute, which means I'm effectively, once you say should you dilute, you're effectively talking about after mixing. It's the after mixing volume we're going to want. That's what we're solving for in this problem. So why don't we rearrange the equation a little bit and say to ourselves, well, I guess the volume after mixing is going to equal the volume before mixing multiplied by the ratio of the molarity before mixing divided by the molarity after mixing. So just an algebraic rearrangement that we've done here. I've done it in this very specific way because really what you see is that the new volume 
effectively is the old volume multiplied by some sort of ratio or fraction. That ratio or fraction is the relative concentrations. And so those re relative uh, uh, concentrations are going to tell you effectively what's going on. If I want to create a solution that's half as concentrated, the coffee is about half as strong as it used to be, unsurprisingly, I am going to have to make the volume twice as big for that to happen is really what that's saying. Twice as big a pool means the stuff floating around has twice as much volume to float around in. That's a lower concentration because, again, concentration is amount over volume in that particular case where the amount is in moles. So in this case, the volume after mixing is going to be our 100.0 milliliters before mixing times our concentration before mixing was 5.00 moles per liter. Our concentration after mixing was 0 0.750 moles per liter. And let me mention just something here. Our concentrations are in moles per liter. Our volume is in milliliters. We could convert this volume to liters if we wanted to. There's no need. And that's because these concentration units will cancel themselves out. That ratio is essentially telling you a comparison. So whether that comparison is being made between two drops of solution, two bathtubs full of solution, or two swimming pools full of solution, the comparison is still going to be the same. So we don't necessarily need to convert our volumes unless our units are really telling us. We see that by doing our dimensional analysis, we're going to get a volume out in milliliters. And since the question is asking us for a volume in milliliters, we are doing just fine. I do need to pull out my calculator here to solve this problem. So just give me a moment to bear with me. We're going to take our five moles per liter, 5.00 really, divided by our 0.750 moles per liter. And what we're going to see is this ratio is really about six and two thirds. Effectively, we're going to see that our volume after mixing is going to have to be six and two thirds bigger than the actual volume that we started with of 100.0 milliliters. So when I multiply this by 100, turns out I am going to get to the three sig figs we are allowed by those concentrations, I'm going to get 667 milliliters. That is what the new solution volume would have to be to get a solution of 0 0.750 moles per liter from the original 5.00 moles per liter. And so, of course, obviously what that means is I would need to add 667 milliliters minus the original 100.0 milliliters. I would have to add 567 milliliters of, in this case, I would assume water, but it could be some other solvent. Again, solution concentration doesn't depend on water, but a lot of the actual solutions we use in first year chemistry, at the very least, are aqueous solutions, ones made in water. So I would have to add 567 milliliters of pure water to that 100.0 milliliters of 5.00 mole per liter calcium chloride solution to get the new solution with the concentration I'm interested in 0.750 moles per liter. So we can get back to our slideshow. We've answered this question. We've done pretty well with that. Pretty good. I see we've got about 15 minutes left in our 50 minute lecture. So the last piece of content that we're going to talk about in this module, the last piece of content we're going to talk about in chapter four is solution stoichiometry. We've seen the idea that if we want to do chemistry using balanced equations, that chemistry has to be done in terms of amounts given in moles. Again, I don't care how heavy slices of bread are. I don't care how heavy slices of cheese are. The recipe to make a cheese sandwich is two slices of bread and one slice of cheese makes a cheese sandwich. The cheese sandwiches that I might get from pumpernickel and cheddar might be a whole lot different than a nice three bun bread and a piece of Havarti, for example. I might get sandwiches of different masses, but at the end of the day, how I make a sandwich is the same. It has to be done in amounts, which in chemistry means moles. 
And we've seen now that we can calculate moles of stuff in solution by taking the concentration, the molarity, and multiplying by the volume. Which means if we want to solve chemical problems involving stuff in solution, the molarity and the volume are pieces of information that I am likely to be given because I can take those and calculate the number of moles of specific chemicals. I then use the stoichiometry of the balanced equation to figure out the relative amounts of other chemicals and how they connect, and then I could potentially connect that to a solution concentration. We've seen this kind of idea in the past, but where we've used masses and molar masses to get moles, now we're using concentrations and volumes to get moles. What happens in the middle when we deal with the chemistry in moles is exactly the same. So in fact, we're going to see that here. We've seen pictures that look very much like this. This is the chemistry. This is the balanced equation where we use the stoichiometric ratio. Would have helped if I had not done that, so back, back, back. So this is kind of the common part for all chemistry problem solving with reactions. You're going to figure out the amount of moles in A, you're going to use the stoichiometry of the balanced equation to figure out the moles of B. In previous problems, we would have connected that to, let's say, the mass of A and the mass of B using the molar mass. Here we can use the concentration and, in this case, the volume of A to connect to the moles, and then we could use the concentration of B to connect to the volume of B that comes out. Just another way of getting to moles so we can do our nuts and bolts of chemical problem solving using balanced equations in the exact same way. So to give you a sense of how that works, let's look at this problem where we want to figure out the number or what volume of an nitric acid solution are we going to need, I just need to find my problem in here as I talk so I can get the problem set up. So what volume of a 0 0.150 mole per liter nitric acid solution will completely react with 35.7 milliliters of a 0 0.108 mole per liter sodium carbonate solution? We've been given a balanced equation. We really should check that this balanced equation is balanced. Never assume that an equation that you've given been given is a balanced one. So let's just take a quick look at the problem solving and see what we can figure out. First, in terms of balance, do we have a balanced equation? Well, I see two sodiums and sodium carbonate there on the reactant side. So right now I've got two sodiums here. Well, there's two sodiums there. So doing pretty good on sodium. Let's look at carbon. There's only one carbon showing on the reactant side, and there's one on the product side. We're doing just fine there. Let's talk about oxygen. We've got three oxygens here, plus another two times three oxygens here. That's six plus three is nine oxygens on the reactant side. Here we've got two point times three, which is six, seven, eight, nine. We've got nine oxygens on both sides. Doing good there. Hydrogens, two of those. Well, here's two hydrogens on the product side. Doing good there. And then one nitrogen, one nitrogen, but again, times two, times two in both cases. Yep, we're doing fine there. We've got all the same number of atoms of each element on both sides. Nothing has a charge here. So there's zero charge on the reactant side. There's zero charge on the product side. This is a balanced equation. Again, most likely probably going to be given a balanced equation, but never assume. I would probably tell you this is an unbalanced equation, and the first thing I'd ask you is to balance the equation for me. But again, always a good habit to get into to check. This question is asking us what volume of a particular nitric acid solution will, and here's a very important set of words, completely react with 35.7 milliliters of a 0 0.108 mole per liter sodium carbonate solution. So, we're actually being asked to solve for the volume of HNO3. That will completely react. Completely react in this case means something very, very specific. We would have seen the idea of limiting reagents before, effectively which chemical we will run out of first. When we say completely react, really what we're saying is let's have us run out of both of the reactants at exactly the same time. And that's going to be important for us because what that's going to imply is the number of moles of nitric acid 
I need will have to equal or be related to the number of moles of sodium carbonate I have as well. But moles are not always equal to moles because of the stoichiometry of the balanced equation. What we see is I need two nitric acid to react with every one sodium carbonate. In other words, the number of moles of nitric acid I need will be twice the number of moles of sodium carbonate I have. Well, we've already seen that the number of moles of something in a solution would be the concentration in the solution times the volume of the solution. So in other words, what we can say now is that the concentration of nitric acid times the volume of nitric acid is going to equal, let's pick a nice new color for this, twice the concentration of sodium carbonate and the volume of sodium carbonate. So we've got the stoichiometry, that's the middle part. That is just my timer telling me, but what you may have noticed is I've had to do a slight edit in this video, so I'm going to finish this problem and then edit the video down to 50 minutes. So let's just complete this so I can get that done. So we want to solve ultimately for this the volume of nitric acid. So why don't we rearrange everything to do that? The volume of nitric acid is going to be twice the concentration of sodium carbonate divided by the concentration of nitric acid all times the volume of sodium carbonate. This is going to be twice uh, 0 0.108 moles per liter. Uh, we have this concentration of 0 0.150 moles per liter. And then we are going to put in our 35.7 milliliters here. And what we're going to find is that our volume of nitric acid has to be 2 times 0 0.108 divided by 0 0.150 all multiplied by the 35.7 milliliters. That is 51.4 milliliters of nitric acid solution that we would have to add to completely react with sodium carbonate in this acid-base reaction. If the stoichiometric ratio of the reaction was one to one, then what we would expect is we would need a smaller volume of the more concentrated solution to neutralize a given volume of the less concentrated solution. In this case, that doesn't work because again, we need twice as much sodium carbonate to react with a, a given amount, well, really, we need twice as much nitric acid to react with a given amount of sodium carbonate. So that essentially is how we would approach this particular question for the problem solve. As we see, this will be the last slide of chapter four of this particular module. That's great, which means when we come back to Tuesday, the 24th pre-recorded lecture, we will start on gases. Thank you all for your attention. You've been great under very trying circumstances. Again, I hope you are safe. I hope you are comfortable. I hope your loved ones and friends are safe and comfortable as well. Keep working hard. Uh, in many cases, much like we are here, we're being very, very strongly encouraged to self-isolate, which means I am sitting around at home quite a bit in your situation, if you are as well. What that means is that you potentially have the distraction that is coming and doing your chemistry work as well as all your other coursework. So be sure to do your Brightspace quizzes when they become available. Keep on top of those daily mastery chemistry assignments and make sure that you're going back and working on any previous work that you've missed as well because that is going to be used to determine your grade in this course.
I really appreciate your attention. I really appreciate you coming and checking this out. Be sure to check out the office hours. If you watch this video in the morning of March 23rd, you can come and ask me questions about it at one o'clock in the blue jeans meeting. If you are watching this after March 23rd, well, nothing says you can't ask me at the next set of virtual office hours. With that, I will shut it down for today. Have a great remainder of whatever day you are watching this or evening, and I will see you again next time. Have a good one, everyone. I'll see you soon.